All right, welcome back, Science 9 students. Uh, we're gonna have another video today. Um, last time we met, we talked about work. Today, we're gonna talk about work and machines. And how simple machines are designed to make our everyday tasks a little bit easier. So, without the help of a simple machine, changing a car tire is very difficult. We have simple machines um, that make this job a lot easier. We have the crowbar that would be needed as a tire iron to loosen up the lug wrenches. We have the simple machine, the jack, to raise up the car. So we have simple machines to make our life a lot easier. What we're gonna learn in the next two sections is how work and simple machines are related. Okay, so how does a machine make work easier? Well, a machine is this, it's a device that changes a force. Uh, machines make work easier by doing one of three things. So a machine could either increase the force, which is what a car jack would do for us. We would put in a force, but then the car jack puts in a lot of force, right? And it raises up the car. Um, another thing uh, machines can do is increase the distance. Um, and third is changing the direction. So those are three things that a simple machine can do for us. So let's start by looking at the force one. So turning the jack handle allows this man to be able to raise a car up, which typically he wouldn't be able to do with just normal human strength. But he's able to with the car jack. He puts in an X amount of force and he gets a lot of um, output force in return. So maybe he puts in 50 newtons of force here and maybe over here there's like 5,000 newtons of force. So it increases the force. So car jacks increase the force. That's one way machines make our lives easier. And this kind of summarizes what would happen. So each complete rotation of a jack handle applies a small force over a large distance. That small force then gets to be multiplied and it, it's able to raise up the car. Um, another thing a simple machine can do is increase the distance through which the force acts. So for instance, um, a rowboat right here, they could, obviously he's gonna be moving this, you know, this distance right here. It's not gonna get very far if that's all he's using to paddle in the water. But on the other end of the, of the rowboat here, it's gonna be increased a lot larger. So that would be another thing that machines can do for us is it increases the distance through which the force acts, which is good. It helps these people roll boat a lot quicker. Um, the third thing is changing the direction of the force. Um, so he is applying the force this way, but the oar goes this way. So that's the third thing machines can do for us is they can change the direction of the force. I'm not sure this is the best picture that the book uses here for saying, oh, it's changing the direction of the force. You know, not like the best example, but there's others out there. All right, so we're gonna talk about, for the last little bit of this video, is work input and work output. Um, so you might be asking, what? What's work input and what's work output? What do you mean? So I guess what I'll do is I'll go back to that slide, because this diagram really explains what's happening here. So you gotta think about work input. So that's like what you're putting into the machine. So the work input would be right here. That's the input force. And this would be the input distance through which it works. So the amount of work he is doing would be this force times this distance, which gives us the work input. That's how much work he's putting into the machine, right? So work input. He moves the ore a certain force um, with a certain force a certain distance. So if you guys recall, work is force times distance. Okay? Um, on the other end of the ore, this is what we're getting out of the machine. So this would be the work output. Okay? So then the output would be, or the work output's calculated by the amount of force that you get through the distance. So it would just be the force times the distance. So this is the work input, what he's putting into the machine. The other end of the ore would be the work that the ore is doing on the water. 
Um, because of friction, the work done by the machine is always a little bit less than what we actually put in the machine, which is a little bit frustrating. So the guy is going to be doing a little bit more work than what we get back out of it because of the pivot point right here where it's pivoting. There's a little bit of friction there, so we're not going to get as much work out of the machine as we would like. Um, now, which brings us up to the idea of perpetual motion. This would be like the perfect simple machine where the work input equals the work output. Nothing's lost. Um, we don't we'll have a device that's perpetual motion yet anyways. The closest device would be like a pendulum clock. You know, the old grandfather clocks that just go bump, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Those are very close perpetual motion. Even a grandfather clock's got to be reset. So, all right. So let's define these. Um, the force exerted on a machine is the work input. So if you think of the guy um, using the oars, that's his input force. The distance the input force acts through is the input distance. So that's his distance he moves. If you multiply the two together, you get the work input because work's calculated by force times distance. So you just need to multiply this force times this distance. That gives you your uh, work input. The output would just be the opposite. Um, the force exerted by the machine is the output force. So if you're thinking about rowing a boat, this is the force of the paddle in the water. Um, the distance that paddle moves would be the output distance. So now you have a force, you can multiply times the distance, and you can get the work output of the machine. So that's how you do it. So for example, if we look at um, the work input versus the work output, I made up some numbers for you so you guys can get a better, um, clear idea of this. So let's just say the rower uses 800 newtons of force to pull on the oars handles, but he's only gonna move them 0.5 of a meter. Could we calculate the work that he did and put into the machine? Yes, we can. So work input equals force times distance. And I'm using just this little N because that's you know, work input is the force input times distance input. Um, so the force that he put in was 800 newtons. The distance was 0.5. So he put in 400 joules of work. So the work input was 400 joules. Let's see what he got back out. Well, he's going to lose a little bit of the force, but it's going to move a lot farther distance. So let's just say it went to uh, two meters and, and uh, with 200 newtons of force. So you would just take 200 times two and you're gonna get 400 joules. This would be in a perfect world, keep in mind, where the work input equals the work output. Um, however, you guys probably know that more than likely we did not get 400 joules of work out of the ore. It's probably more like 390, 370. You might be wondering, well, where'd the other 10 or 20 go? Well, it got lost due to friction with the ore. Okay. And the only way to increase the amount of work output is to put more into the machine. Let's see here. Um, let's just do a couple of these. I'll leave some for you guys to try at home. Uh, the work output of machine is always greater than the work input of the machine. What do you guys think? What do you think about it? So work output. So that's like what you're getting out of it. It's always greater than the input. Well, no, we learned that we have to put more in than we get out. So answer is false. Okay, that wraps up 13.2. Next time you see me, we'll be talking about the simple machines.